hang in there if you're if you're like me and you're not quite there yet because you're going to find a story that changes your life and touches your heart and once that happens you'll never look back Hey everyone, I'm Bianca Schultz from the Children's Book Review, and this is the Growing Readers Podcast. Today's guest is an all-time favorite author of mine, Newbery medalist Catherine Applegate. She's here to talk about her latest stunning novel, Otter, the story of an intrepid sea otter. A number one New York Times bestselling author, Catherine Applegate has written so many books for young readers, including the one and only Ivan, winner of the 2013 Newbery Medal. Catherine's novels have been translated into dozens of languages. Her books have won accolades, including the Christopher Medal, the Golden Kite Award, the Bank Street Rosette Frank Award, the California Book Award Gold Medal, the Crystal Kite Award, the Green Earth Book Honor Award, the Charlotte Zoloto Honor Award, and the E.B. White Read Aloud Award. Many of her works have appeared on state master lists, Publishers Weekly, USA Today, New York Times bestseller lists, and best of the year lists from School Library Journal, Kirkus, Amazon, the New York Public Library, and the Chicago Public Library. Catherine has two adult children and lives in Los Angeles with her husband and assorted pets. Before we dive into our chat, here's the synopsis for Otter. A touching and lyrical tale about a remarkable sea otter from Newbery medalist Catherine Applegate, author of Wish Tree. Meet Otter, the queen of play. Nobody has her moves. She doesn't just swim to the bottom. She dive bombs. She doesn't just somersault. She triple donuts. She doesn't just ride the waves. She makes them. Otter spends her days off the coast of Central California, practicing her underwater acrobatics and spinning the quirky stories for which she's known. She's a fearless daredevil, curious to a fault. But when Otter comes face to face with a hungry great white shark, her life takes a dramatic turn. One that will challenge everything she believes about herself and about the humans who hope to save her. Inspired by the true story of a Monterey Bay Aquarium program that pairs orphaned otter pups with surrogate mothers, this poignant and humorous tale, told in free verse, examines bravery and healing through the eyes of one of nature's most beloved and charming animals. Hi, Catherine. Welcome to the Growing Readers podcast today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. The plan is to talk about your new book, Otter. But before we do, I just saw that the one and only Ruby will release in May of 2023. And I just need to get it off my chest as to how excited I am. And that's (laughs) like, I'm really, 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 really excited. Not just because my (laughs) middle name is Ruby, but love her character. So I can't wait. Oh, that has been so much fun to write because she's a totally different voice from Ivan and Bob. You know, she's, well, she's young and she's silly and, and very emotional. And I go back into Africa for just a bit and also discuss her new life. And it's, it was just really fun. And I, of course, love doing research. So it was great because I got to delve into elephants even even more than I had. Oh, that's awesome. There's going to be so many excited people for this book. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I hope so. Well, I'm always drawn to the books that you create because of the level of humanity and care and dignity that you bring to your stories and the characters within them. I'd love to know what drives you and guides you in creating books for children. Oh, it's so it it's so complicated because it's so multifaceted. I I think at the end of the day, the most important thing to me is that a children's book leave you with hope. 
because I think sometimes hope is in short supply. I'm a, a devout pessimist. And I think writing uh, books for children is actually therapeutic for me because I, I it helps me find those paths to hope. One of the things I love is doing school visits because I get to hang out with, you know, the very readers are going to be um, uh, connecting, hopefully, with my books. And they're always so idealistic and uh, energetic, and they're figuring out how they fit into the world. And there's just, you can't spend the day with, you know, middle, middle grade readers and not come away feeling more hopeful. So I think the most important thing is starting with that, that approach. And uh, I, I've been telling kids lately, I, one of the things I find very interesting about writing is for me, uh, I often find I'm channeling anger things that make me really mad or uh, frustrated, sometimes passionate or, or, or curious, but more often it's like, oh my gosh, like when I heard about Ivan stuck in a cage for 27 years, I, I was devastated and I wanted to write about it. I wrote Wish Tree um, during, you know, a very vitriolic election cycle. And unfortunately, we're, we're still kind of seeing that, but I just wanted to talk about compassion and, and acceptance. So sometimes uh, if you can't think what to write about, look at what's making you really mad. I think that's a good good place to start. Oh my gosh. I, I love that. It made me understand why I love your stories so much. Let's talk specifically about Otter. There are so many reasons why I had to pick up this book and read it. And let's not kid around here. The story is about adorable and mesmerizing sea otters, which just <laughs> happen to be one of my favorite animals. And I'm not going to hold back here. The world literally stopped for me just for a moment when I first spotted Charles Santoso's book <gasps> cover illustration. Yes. So let's let's start with the book cover and 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 Charles's art and how it makes you feel. Oh, Charles is absolutely amazing. And this is the third cover I've been lucky enough to have him do. He did Wish Tree as well and Willa Dean. And he just, he is magical with everything, but especially animals. He's just got this gift. And when I saw that cover, I was like, you know, I was just blown away. I mean, I, I don't think I've ever had a book that didn't have an amazing cover on it. I've been really lucky that way. But I, how can you walk past that and not not go? Oh, I must have this book. This this adorable little creature is looking out at me with those beautiful eyes, just uh, just amazing. Um, and they uh, they have been giving away some art prints for pre orders, and I of course managed to scarf a few for myself. And they're they're just beautiful. I can't wait to frame it because it's just. Uh, Oh I gosh. never get tired of looking at it. He's so good. And his interior art is equally charming. It's just that that cover, you just go, whoa. Yeah, just the way, you know, Otto's head is just kind of like cocked to the side a little bit too. Uh -huh. It's just like everything <laughs> about it is just gorgeous. And I love just like the detail of every little stro like streak of, of fur. Anyway, just I, I love his artwork. So... <laughs> <laughs> I do too. Let's dig into the story. One probably should never assume things, but I feel like it's pretty safe to say that you do enjoy researching and learning about new animals and environments. So what was it about sea otters and essentially the conservation of sea otters that compelled you to write the story of otter? Well, okay, let's start with the fact, as you point out, they are about as cute as an animal can get. And I, I'm lucky enough, I live in Los Angeles, but there is this amazing aquarium in Monterey, uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium, that I had visited a few times. And the otters are just mesmerizing. If you see them in the wild, it's even, even more the case, but there's something about seeing them really up close, just a few inches away, twirling and swirling in the water. It's just balletic. It's absolutely beautiful. And something about that fun, they look like they've been, they, it looks like they never stop having fun. In fact, otter lives are very complicated, but man, when they're in the water, they just, uh, they just look like you know, nothing can go wrong and life is good. So I was really interested in them, knew very little about them. And part of my research, I went to the, the aquarium. I was going to go back because 
uh, an integral part of the story is the fact that they have a surrogate otter program that helps uh, acclimate abandoned orphan baby otters back into the wild by using um, otters that have been declared non-releasable and live at the aquarium as sort of surrogate moms. So I was going to go back and hang out with the babies, uh, but this was, you know, primetime COVID and they were very, very worried about, you know, any kind of infection. So uh, instead, I went to the aquarium and then I went to Elkhorn Slough, which is this little sort of swampy uh, Monterey Bay adjacent waterway where many of the otters have settled and where they they breed and where they when they return to the wild where they acclimate and it's it's a really fun tour because you're you're, you're gliding through the water and there they are two feet away just having a good time so that was my initial research and of course I did I have you know a volume upon volume of otter books now piled up on my desk. But one of the most important things I think I did was to have it vetted, the manuscript once it was done by a couple of the marine biologists there. They call them aquarists, actually, I learned. And um, that was really helpful because I, I based my otters on uh, actual otters in the same way I, Ivan was inspired by an actual gorilla. And I sort of created a composite because I needed bits and pieces of uh, their backstories. But I tried to stay as close as I could to what had actually happened. And so I wanted to make sure I got all that right. I think one of the great things about stories is that they can transport us back to a time or a place or they can inform us and tell us about places we've never been. And as you said, like Monterey Bay Aquarium is kind of a big part of Otter's story. And for me, I've been lucky enough to, to go to that aquarium a, a couple of times. And it's such, ah. it's such an incredible like space and place. And so I love that for some readers, it may connect them to the place that they've been like, I've been there, you know, which is great. But for others, I feel like it will intrigue them into wanting to to maybe head to their own aquarium or or head mm -hmm. to Monterey. And, and I love that. So I'm just wondering, what do you want readers that, that haven't picked up a copy of Otter? What do you want them to know about the role that Monterey Bay Aquarium plays in the story? You know, I should mention before I forget that they have an otter cam at their website and you can watch them playing and interacting with uh, the caretakers and it's it's really fun to watch. Monterey Bay Aquarium has been on the, at the forefront of this approach to uh, caring for these orphan babies. And they would get lots of them over the decades and what they used to do, it, which struck me as remarkable, and I include this in Otter's story, they would basically try to pretend to be Otter moms and dads. And that extended to teaching them how to open clams and how to, uh, how to wrap themselves in kelp so they don't float away, but also taking them into the bay to swim. And strangely enough, they would, they would stay connected to these, uh, to these human slash otter pals and go back to the aquarium. But eventually, when they finally were ready, they hoped to be released, they were so used to humans that they were jumping on kayaks and, you know, leaping on decks. And uh, this was a problem, in fact, for Otter and um, my story, and in fact, for the otters on whom she's based. So what they realized was if they could entice uh, these, uh, occasionally they'd have otters who simply couldn't go back into the wild. They were too injured. Great white shark bites are a big problem. Toxoplasmosis, which comes from, um, strangely enough, from cat feces, from uh, even domestic cats, but certainly feral cats is a big problem. So these otters would get sick and they take them in and they couldn't go back into the wild. And they had a particular otter who they brought in who was ill. They didn't know she was pregnant and she had a stillbirth. And that very day, uh, a baby uh, orphaned otter came into their care and they thought, hey, you know, let's give it a shot. And it worked and she took over. But what was more miraculous was that subsequent otters who had not recently been pregnant or um, ever cared for young would take in these babies and just, you know, okay, I got this. I'm, I'm going to teach them how to, how to be an otter. And what the aquas started doing was wearing these bizarre outfits. They called them their Darth Vader look, and they would wear welders helmets. They still do this. And these big black 
you know, sort of ponchos so that their humanness was almost entirely eliminated. And so that the baby otters were only bonding with these surrogate moms and not at all with the humans. And since they've done that, they've had remarkable success getting these orphans back into the wild. They've, they've bred, they've had their own babies and the, the whole process is being duplicated by other aquaria. So it's, it's, they really have, have done amazing work and it's been a trial and error. It's been a, it, it was absolutely fascinating learning about how they how they came to the the right process because it, it was it was hard. I don't want to give any spoilers away. It's always something I try really really hard hard <laughs> not to do. So what I loved about reading Otter is that I could tell that you had done so much research. And what's great is that you have that back matter in the you know in the last pages that really just tied in at a greater understanding and it helped me to learn more about the otters. And so do you hope that otter will inspire young readers to get involved in environmental efforts? Because it definitely inspired me. And you mentioned the the otter cams, which you there were links in the back matter to the otter cams. So I went right to those and and, and checked them out. And it was adorable. <laughs> I think the Elkhorn slew when like there was literally a mama otter with a baby on its belly. Anyway, back to my oh. question. <laughs> Do you hope that it's going to inspire young readers to get involved in environmental efforts? I actually had someone, I think it was on Goodreads, say exactly that, that if you had a, a young um, a aspiring biologist, especially marine biologist, that this was just the book for them. And that made me so happy because I would love for that to happen. What's so cool about this whole story is that in the um, early 1900s, they were down to 50, five zero otters in this area. Miraculously, a handful of people went, wait, maybe there's a way to, you know, to keep these guys alive and maybe even expand the population. And it was the earliest start of the conservation efforts in that area. And now they're up to, I want to say 3,000. It's not a huge population, but it's a, it's a solid population. And, um, they have all kinds of threats they're still facing, as as are so many. Um, you know, of course, climate change, the water temperature. I mentioned the great white sharks, which are are closing. It's it's almost comical because these sharks are often young, and they're hungry. And in fact, my uh, opening scene with Otter involves a great white shark. It's not it's not too gruesome, but it is scary, a, a little bit scary. And these guys are hungry. They go out of their range, and they see these these black things floating in the water that look kind of sleek and they think, oh, seal, blubber, or they think, oh, surfer, tasty. And they they bite the otter. And then the otter, of course, is nothing but the densest fur on earth, which is how they manage to stay in the water all the time. And the shark is, of course, repulsed and spits out the otter. But unfortunately, you know, it's a little hard on the otter. So that has been a problem. There are all kinds of issues. And, and otters are keystone species, which means they are vital to an ecosystem. In this case, the, the bay depends on the otters and their appetite. And uh, it's very important that we have them and that they stick around. So if, if even two or three kids go, yeah, that's what I want to do someday. Oh, that would be great. We'll be right back after this message from our sponsor. Today's supporter is Jennifer Swanson, the award-winning author of over 45 books for children. She is also a teacher, STEM advocate, and creator and co-host of the Solve It For Kids podcast. Her latest nonfiction picture book is Footprints Across the Planet. Every footprint from the physical to the digital and the permanent to the fleeting leaves a mark on earth telling a story of the past, the present, or the future. What type of imprint will you leave? Journey around the world and experience through vivid photographs how every being on the planet leaves an imprint with their feet, their words, their actions. Whether human or animal, voices or activity, each mark has a purpose. To remind us of our history, give us a glimpse of our future, and maybe even inspire us to change the world. 
Footprints Across the Planet is perfect for the aspiring STEM activists in your life, those who want to change the world, and is available wherever good books are sold. You can visit jenniferswansonbooks.com for more information. You know, I love that you brought up the the shark scene and and that it is a young shark that is in the beginning of your book. And even though, like, sure, the idea of this sweet otter maybe becoming a snack for a shark, you know, <laughs> in 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 theory, that's a little scary. But you do just this beautiful job of applying perspective, even though you know the shark is a side character in your story. It's 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 it moves the plot along, but you you give you give a a feeling to this shark that is a level of understanding that the shark needs to eat too. The shark exists in this in this space and the shark is just doing what the shark knows how to do. So like right. even though in theory it you know that it, it sounds scary, but it's such a great introduction to just the life cycle and and what is what happens in the ocean and I love the way that you delivered it oh that's good to hear yeah I wanted you know obviously I'm I, I'm always thinking about my younger readers and I want to make sure that nothing's too scary but I want to be as accurate and honest as I can I think because yeah we don't want spoilers do they I found myself heading into one um, <laughs> but, but but fear not let's just say it'll it, all will be well. <laughs> yeah. I feel like I hear I hear some like listeners saying, no, we want the spoiler. We want the spoiler. Tell us. Now. <laughs> so I think here's my other question for you too, then, because you do visit a lot of schools and, you know, even if it's just one, two, three, four kids that decide that they want to get involved in environmental efforts, have you come across or discovered sort of any fun entry points or ways for kids to get involved you know, they've read your book, whether it's about Ivan or, if, you know, when Ruby comes out or or if, if it's Otter and somebody says, hey, I want to I want to do more. I want to know more. Like, what are some good entry points for them? Oh, you know, it's one of the things that my wonderful publisher Macmillan did with uh, Willowdean. And I believe the site was readwillowdean.com was create a sort of teacher slash student guide for, you know, ways to get involved, ways to think about conservation, contacts, both at, you know, a very com low community level where you're, you know, maybe you're picking up trash or maybe you're creating a little club within your own school. One thing I've often suggested to kids is to become the resident expert on a particular species at your school. Um, become the person who discovers where the best you know, if you collect some pennies, where should they go? What's the best conservation effort going on? Um, for example, with elephants, it's, it's hard to even know where to start. There are so many. One I recommend, and this is largely because we were talking about Ruby, um, she ends up in a an elephant orphanage for a while. And the Sheldrick Trust in Kenya runs an elephant orphanage. And the same thing is true for gorillas. They're magnificent organizations. So you become the local expert and you learn everything you possibly can. And then you become, a, you know, a one man, one woman advocate. And I think one thing that's very cool is that schools are starting to create groups that are eco-focused. And there are so many ways climate change is affecting us all now that it's it's vital that this happen. I I sense that anxiety when I talk to kids. I mean, all you have to do is look out the window. It's it's not lost on on them that we adults have not exactly handled our our care for Mother Earth as well as we might have. And I love seeing their uh, their energy and instincts to step up. I, that's when I get most hopeless, and then I talk to them, and I think, no, maybe maybe this is going to be okay after all. So there are there are myriad places to start. Let's talk about writing style now. So this book is a perfect candidate for anyone, in my opinion, who enjoys reading aloud to kids because every line break or like where the words have been designed to sort of dance and bubble across the page, it really lends itself beautifully to almost a playful and dramatic inflection and feeling. So I'd love to hear you talk about the lyrical style in which you wrote Otter 
and why you chose to write this story this way? You know, the, um, the last book I did in free verse was called Home of the Brave. And I love doing it. It's, I think I'm a frustrated poet at heart. And I, I, my favorite part of writing is chiseling down that big, messy rock of words and trying to find, you know, a diamond in all the, the coal. And uh, plotting on the other hand, oh man, plotting is hard. So for me, writing in free verse was just uh, an absolute delight and made it much, much easier in many ways. Also, when you're in the head of an animal, by definition, you're going to be somewhat anthropomorphic, no matter how much research you do. And writing in free verse allows you to circumvent a little bit of that, I think, to get as close to you know, the experience of, of twirling in the water, for example, or being chased by a shark um, and make it more, I don't know, visceral. So it, it felt very natural. It felt very appropriate for this particular story because I spent almost the whole time in Otter's Head. Two or three times I leap out just long enough to explain what's going on with some of the human caretakers so that the kids can can be, sh so that I'm, it's, absolutely clear, you know, for example, that they've tagged her so that she won't get lost, things like that. But for the most part, it's all in her head. And for me, free verse just lent itself perfectly to that. I mean, honestly, it was so beautiful. I I uh, oh. started to read it and I thought, I'm, you know, I when you pick up a book, even if it's an author like you that I, I love, I've loved every story, but you really don't know until you've read it how you're going to feel. And I, I plan to read it over three different sittings and I sat down and I read it from beginning to end. I couldn't stop. <laughs> Oh, that, yeah. that's lovely to hear. That's yeah. really nice. It was and it's funny. The, I think kids will read anything. That's one of the reasons I love writing for middle middle grade because, you know, they're open minded. Give it, give it a shot. Sure, it's an otter. Why not? But sometimes adults are a little more resistant to animal books, and I think it's it's wonderful to hear that you enjoyed it. I don't want to put you on the spot, but I kind of am going to put you on the spot. Do you have <laughs> a copy with you now? And if you do. Would you be willing to read a short excerpt? Oh, absolutely. All right. Let me let me pull it up while we're sitting here. Let's see. Oh, I think I have it here. Okay. Why don't I just do the um the beginning? So Otter opens, and Otter, by the way, is spelled with two D's, which has already caused great consternation among many children. <laughs> um Opens with a quote from uh, Ralph, Ralph uh, Waldo Emerson. It is a happy talent to know how to play. And I think when we think of otters, play is is the first and most important thing you, you imagine. In fact, the, the first section is called the Queen of Play. Not exactly guilty. In their defense, sharks do not, as a rule, eat otters. True Sharks sometimes taste them by mistake, leaving frowning bites or the jagged clue of a tooth or two. But then, in fairness, nobody's perfect. Too late. Say an empty-bellied great white shark is enticed by a long, sleek swimmer. A sea lion, perhaps. Big fans of blubber sharks. Curious. The shark moves in for a nibble, only to discover he's sampling a surfer. Oops. Or more likely, a member of that most charming branch of the weasel family, the southern sea otter. You've been there, haven't you? In the cafeteria line or the breakfast buffet, taking a chance on some new food. Grab, gulp, grimace. You spit the offending item into a napkin. No harm, no foul. Same goes for the shark, who quickly reconsiders and retreats. Of course, by then it's often too late for the surfer and almost always too late for the otter. Oh my gosh. I, so I have to tell you when I sat down and started reading, my kids were sitting at the dinner table eating their dinner. And <laughs> I read the part <laughs> where it says, you've been there in the cafeteria, <laughs> spitting your food into the napkin. I had to look, I'm not going to say any names, but I looked exactly at one of my children and we had to pause for a little chuckle. <laughs> been there, done that, huh? Like I said before, I love how the line break lend to the sort of poetic nature and it almost creates like a, a silent musical soundtrack into how you read it. Anyway, that's how, that's how it felt to me. And I do love the way you also 
bring the reader in to sort of have this relatable moment. Thank you for reading that. I loved it. Of course, of course. Well, since this podcast is the Growing Readers podcast, I would be remiss not to ask my signature question. To be a writer, it is often said that you need to be a reader first. So was there a pivotal moment in which you considered yourself a reader? Absolutely. But I have to confess that probably unlike, I would guess, 90% of the people uh, to whom you asked that question, I was not a big reader as a kid. And I always confess this right up front when I talk to kids. And it wasn't any particular reason. I just hadn't found the right book. Um, I happen to have a daughter who has dyslexia. You know, and that can make it very challenging to read, but with great teachers, you can overcome it. But that wasn't my issue. I just thought it was boring. And it wasn't until I had a teacher reach Charlotte's Web that I realized there was something special to books. And it was because I was a huge animal fan. I wanted to be a veterinarian when I was growing up. In fact, I worked for a vet in high school. And then I realized along the way I was more interested on, you know, what was going on inside their heads than maybe inside their their bodies. But Charlotte's Web was was the turning point. And it probably has been the turning point for, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. It's just that kind of book. And I go back and read it every so often. And I still find new things to love about it. And that's the sign of a very special book. Yes, I love that that was a special book for you. I, you know, it is such an amazing book. And like you said, a turning point for so many young readers. But I would say that even now for a lot of people or a lot of children that what was Charlotte's Web for us, I would say the one and only Ivan is probably that book for a lot of the children right now. Um, I truly believe that. Um, oh my, that's, that's high praise indeed. I do. I have had a lot of people with reluctant readers who said it was a turning point because it's a, it looks like a real book. You know, it's a big fat book with a big fat story, but it's accessible because there isn't a lot on the page and all that white space is reassuring. So yeah. Uh, and I think for me, I, you know, I'm probably still uh, writing that way because, you know, that's the kind of reader I am. I'm still a very slow reader. I kind of read to, you know, absorb the words. I don't rush through books. So maybe I'm still writing for myself. One of my children proclaims that she's a slow reader as though that's a negative Thing. And I'm always like, oh, no, 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 I'm a slow reader too. And that's because you're soaking up every single word, you know, you're really taking it in. And I, yeah, I'm all here for slow reading. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best kind. And sometimes I'll, um, I'll read once for, you know, kind of the, the gist, the plot, and then I'll go back and read to savor the words. And, and that's, man, I just love that part. That's the best part. Yes. A lot of people, you know, in our space will say that if a child isn't a reader yet, it's because they just haven't found the right book. And I do believe that's true for like 99% of the kids. But you mentioned that your daughter has dyslexia. And so I'm just curious if you would share a little bit about maybe that experience from a per from a parent's perspective, because I feel like sometimes dyslexia is missed in children as though they're just a reluctant reader and that they just mm -hmm. aren't choosing to or that they haven't found the right book. But but it is indeed it's it's challenging to read. And that's why they they haven't been able to connect with reading. Um, I don't have experience with dyslexia, but I would just love to hear your thoughts on maybe if we did have a listener who had a child with dyslexia and, you know, has been trying to like, you know, just find the next right book. But but maybe that isn't the answer answer for them? You know, uh, first of all, oh, it's so important to have good teachers. And especially there are specialists who just uh, did amazing work with my daughter. And recognizing it early is, is a huge part of it. And you're right, a lot of times people think you're just not a big reader. And it's so much more complex than that. We had great luck with graphic novels. She adored graphic novels like um, Smile, was life changing, and um, the other thing is audiobooks are great, and those two things I think will often help kids, both reluctant readers, but uh, especially kids with dyslexia, to overcome the initial resistance. Um, those illustrations in a good graphic novel will take you over the 
the the hard moments and certainly hearing an audiobook or reading along with an audiobook is amazingly effective so it's a slow process and you have to be patient but it happens and i think it's so great that there are specialists now who can really walk kids through that i wish they had more funding so that uh, more kids could could have that kind of help Yes, absolutely. Catherine, before we go, if listeners were to take just one thing away from our conversation today, what would you want that to be? Oh, <laughs> why is that always such a hard question? It's just, um, you know, I I think the most important thing I want kids, I, kids to know, far beyond otters or gorillas or anything else, is read what you love. There is a book out there that's going to change your life. And it might be a graphic novel. It might be nonfiction. It might be um, journalism. It might even be uh, song lyrics. There are all kinds of ways to fall in love with the written word. And hang in there if you're if you're like me and you're not quite there yet because you're going to find a story that uh, changes your life and touches your heart. And once that happens, you'll never look back. Here, here. <laughs> Catherine, <laughs> thank you so much for writing the books that stay on my family's bookshelf. Like we have our bookshelves where the, the books cycle in and out. And then we have our bookshelf, which is our forever books. And you write the books Aww. that stay on our forever shelf. So thank you so much for, <laughs> for being that person for us, that author for us. And thank you for being on the show and sharing your time with us today. Oh, thank you. It's been an absolute delight. Thank you so much for joining us on this quest for growing readers. Be sure to check out our show notes. You'll find links to order a copy of Otter by Katherine Applegate. If you like this show, remember, you can hear it on Apple Podcasts, Chromecast, Spotify, or anywhere else you enjoy listening. Subscribe to the show to get new episodes as soon as they launch. If you're enjoying our book chats, please leave us a review. And while you're at it, tell a friend to come and have a listen. The Growing Readers Podcast is a production of the Children's Book Review. To discover more books, I hope you'll visit us at thechildrensbookreview.com.